Welcome to The Loins of History. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. Uh, We're a podcast about connecting history with current events, and this is going to be our final episode in our series on a history of capitalism and socialism in the United States. Uh, In our last episode, we talked about the inflations in, or inflation and kind of the economic woes of the 1970s and how that brought us Reaganomics or, or supply side economics. And uh, this episode, we're going to be covering what happened in the 90s. And then we're also going to recap uh, kind of just some big key takeaways for uh, the series on the whole. So Colin, what are those big takeaways? So there can be a lot of takeaways from this episode, but the three main ones that we want to focus on are the triumph of capitalism and how it actually beat socialism, not by just an outright duel, if you will, of competing theories, but really just the absorption of socialism to become what uh, many economists call a quote unquote mixed economy. How our economy today is similar to our economies right before a recession. So even though we're not economists, you can take a look at the history, you can take a look at what was going on and see uh, what led up to those recessions and how to uh, what to expect of the the coming one or the one that we're technically already in. And then finally, uh, we're going to take a look at the Great Recession, the immediate fallout reactions to that, and how the capitalists and socialist movements within our, comp- our country, what their thoughts on it and why that led us to today and how it led us to today. So uh, those are the, the big three, Jay. Awesome. So with that, take us into the 90s. What happened after Reaganomics? The 90s. What a decade. So it, it's funny. The, mm. you go ahead and stand by for some some anecdotes and pop culture references because Jay Love and it. I were, <laughs> we're getting into current events and this is where we were alive. So, you know, the 90s, uh, uh, here's an anecdote. I feel like everybody over the age of 30 kind of pines for the 90s and that feel good time because it was kind of a feel good decade. You know, if you've ever watched Portlandia, which I highly recommend, um, like the opening skit is like the the dream of the 90s is alive in Portland. Um, so the 90s <laughs> were, it's a great song. Um, the 90s were a decade where, in my personal opinion, we were kind of at the zenith of our hegemony globally. Yeah. The Cold War had just ended. We were pre-9-11. We were by far the strongest country militarily, economically, mm-hmm. politically. Mm-hmm. Um, it, just to put it into perspective, the Desert Storm w- happened in 91. Uh, Iraq at the time had the fourth largest army in the world. And the actual shooting only occurred for like 100 hours. It was yep. just wiped the floor with them. Like every other country looked at us. Um, as a matter of fact, the Chinese and Russians study it to this day. This yeah. is the American military capability. Like we, this is frightening how strong they are. Economically speaking, you know, the Soviet Union had collapsed. So there was all of this international trade opportunities that were opening up for the US to make a lot of money on. And actually, as a matter of fact, that kind of leads up to one of the recessions that we'll get to in a second. But hmm. there was this overall sentiment in the US of we're safe now, the Cold War is over. We can let down our guard. The threat of a nuclear holocaust is gone. Nobody is strong enough to touch us. We call the shots. We're number one. And everything just kind of felt safe and very easygoing. So I think that's kind of the feeling that people want to get back to. I mean, just like as a small example, before the 9-11 with TSA, you could walk up to your gate at the airport and just get on the plane. Give them your ticket and get on the plane. Like that was... That was almost like a small example of what life was like in the 90s. So I'm even kind of waxing poetic about it right now. (laughs) But let's get into the actual events. Economically speaking, there was a slight recession um, in like 9091. Bill Clinton was elected because uh, George Bush Sr. uh, said, read my lips, no new taxes. He raised taxes, pissed off Ross Perot, and Ross Perot came in there as a fired up Texan who is actually a really very smart individual, but he took um, like 12%, I think of the vote or something like that caused, uh, caused George Bush not to win uh, re-election and, and Bill Clinton came in. So politically speaking, you had a Democrat president, but you had a Congress, uh, you know, so you had this Republican Congress. So it was this balance of power similar to Reagan and 
Tip O'Neill in the eighties, but mm -hmm. um, Bill Clinton was the epitome of like a moderate economically speaking during the Clinton years. So he actually raised taxes in 93. Um, yeah. And just looking at some of the numbers as to like what he actually raised, um, the top tax bracket went up to like 36%. Um, there's um, some repeals of taxes, but like Medicare taxes went up on your payroll. There was like a 4.3% increase on uh, gas taxes. And there's just a couple other Meanwhile, states were lowering taxes, but like by and large, taxes went up in 93, but the economy still began to grow around 95, 96. And this kind of lends into this, well, what caused this growth? Was it Bill Clinton and his increase in taxes? So a lot of economists look back at the 90s and they say, well, we can raise taxes and still have economic growth. And there's a professor at Harvard named Dale Jorgensen who would disagree. This guy, uh, Professor Jorgensen, he basically said that um, the tax increase was not why the economy grew. As a matter of fact, that um, that probably even slowed the economic recovery and growth coming out of that recession. What really caused it was the you know the uh, proliferation of digital technology. So. It's weird to think about for like Gen Z out there, but there was a time when people just like didn't have the internet in their house and you just didn't have even potentially a computer. But in the 90s, there was a significant investment in semiconductors and chip technology that made prices go down. So the ability to afford a computer like at home or in your business, it became very realistic. So prices on semiconductors um, went down competition amongst different companies in decreased the prices even further. So there is a significant investment and it created this like positive feedback loop um, within the digit, you know, the IT industry where tons of money was flowing in and it absolutely fueled this growth um, in the tech sector. And then, you know, because this, the tech sector was taking off, it was influencing other parts of the economy to grow. So despite higher taxes in 93, the economy began to just take off in like 90, 95, 96. And then in 97, we repealed a lot of those tax increases um, with the Republican Congress. Bill Clinton even signed it in 97. And that just sent the economy booming. So we had this booming mm -hmm. economy um, fueled by growth in the tech sector. And honestly, if you look at it, it was very balanced. And I, I go back to this with this capitalism absorbing socialism. So Bill Clinton was not uh, a New Deal Democrat like Lyndon B. Johnson was, but he wasn't radical like Calvin Coolidge in the sense that he's just going to cut everything. He did cut um, some federal, like the federal budget. He cut the amount of federal workers and employees. Um, but he didn't get rid of a lot of the New Deal or Great Society programs. So like Medicare, Medicaid, a lot of these benefit programs still existed and he left them there. Um, but he was able to even like we balanced the budget and had a surplus for the first time in like 30 years in 1998, which is yeah. un it's like you can't even fathom that right now um, with the way we mm. spend and how just our economic policy in general. Which, which is huge because let's – I'm glad you said that Bill Clinton was an – what you call him? An economic moderate? Yes. The epitome of it. He was an economic moderate because, yes, he raised taxes, but he balanced the budget, which, correct me if I'm wrong, no Republican has ever done that. And Republicans are the biggest ones that talk about the debt and, and they criticize uh, big government spending, et cetera. And yet Bill Clinton – actually he actually did it um so i don't you know here here at the lords of history i like to remain balanced when balanced is called for right like the we it we can't just say like oh you know slick willie he's having affairs in office he was a terrible president like okay but regardless of what your opinion is on that economically speaking like it was a good time and there were yeah. raised taxes with it so, it, and that kind of ties in, you know, if you go back to our episode on the history of political parties, when we start talking about this era, there was a lot of mudslinging and a lot of, this is the birth of a lot of distrust between the political parties and kind of a separation of them. But again, to Bill Clinton's credit, the, in the raising of taxes, 
it wasn't like a political stunt. It wasn't to pay for some program that was going to be 10 times more expensive than what they estimated. It was to balance the budget, which he did. And yeah. he had a Republican Congress that he had to work with, You know, the conservative right. coalition that he had to work with. And then eventually they lowered taxes, which fueled growth even more. So all things considered, and I still even remember like seeing videos of like them, you know, there's the debt clock going in, um, Mm -hmm. in New York. And I just remember seeing videos like when we, they balanced the budget, it's like stopped. It's just like, you know, if you look at it right now, it's just, it's, it's crazy how fast those numbers are going up. But you looked at it then it was like, it stopped and people Hmm. were just kind of looking at it. And it was was just kind of a cool scene you think about. And it's, it makes me feel so old because that was like 24 years ago, but it is a big deal to have a balanced budget, something we haven't done. All that to say, like, even though the nineties were good, economically speaking, um, there were, um, you know, the, like we talked about the growth of the it sector, that led to a recession. Um, but I, before I get to that, I just want to highlight this. The first point is with capitalism, it absorbed the, so this is the epitome of a mixed economy. Again, I say that because Bill Clinton did not get rid of a lot of this federal spending. It didn't go away. Some of it got reduced, but it didn't go away completely. It was still there and there was still some heavy federal spending. Like that was a major part of the economy was this public sector spending. But he also was able to help fuel private industry growth. So this is the the ideal mixed economy. And I would argue that capitalism won, kind of like the um, you know, the British monarchy just absorbing and sharing power with parliament, British Parliament. You know, they they figured out how to work together. And it's, you know, even though you can argue that a mixed economy doesn't technically exist, this is what economists would refer to. So Colin, that is really interesting, man. How one question I have is how did how did the dot-com boom and then subsequent bust in, in like the IT industry impact the economy in the 90s? That's a great question. So we just talked about how, you know, from 95 to 2000, this boom in the economy driven by um, semiconductor technology and chip technology and just really revolutionized the way we did work. So if we look back at a lot of previous... Um, economic booms, it's a lot, it's a lot of speculation and people get FOMO and they want to invest. Well, the same goes for this, uh, this dot com bubble. So I want to make money too. Exactly. I want to make money too. <laughs> well, you know, it, do you remember the E-Trade commercial? It came out in like 99 or 2000, like right at the peak of the dot com bubble. It was like, he's got money coming out of the wazoo. You yeah. Could, yeah. He's, he's got, got money got... coming out of the wazoo. <laughs> and that was the first, you know, that was like this, you know, what they say, democratization of, of trading where people could sign on to E-Trade and invest money. So, People were getting calls from their brokers about where to invest, this new IPO, this new company. So with all this money flowing into Silicon Valley, which is the IT industry in general, a lot of companies began to get it. They would get an idea and they would pour whatever um, capital they had into advertising, marketing, and kind of this flashy idea of what they can do, but they never actually really produced revenue. So an when a company would IPO, and just so, just for everybody's uh, awareness, um, an IPO is an initial public offering, and that refers to the process of offering shares of a private corporation to the public in a new uh, stock issuance for the first time. So, um, basically, it's done so companies can raise more c- capital from um, the average retail investor. So now you've got John Q. Public throwing their money into a company and it helps them raise a lot of capital. So um, it's a big event for a company. And this is happening hundreds of times a year for these new companies uh, IPOing. I think at one point it was like four to 500 per year uh, from 95 to 2000. In the first quarter of 2000 alone, there was like 81. So once a company goes public, the responsibility of that company is to the shareholder and their responsibility to that shareholder is to make money, is to increase revenue and profitability to make them money. Those companies were not doing it. So like I said, they were pouring all of their capital, all of their money into this marketing um, 
really putting some paint on the outside to make it look like they were doing something great, but they never actually generated a profit. A lot of them never even generated revenue. It was an, it was an idea. They put together a company on paper. They had a great marketing idea. I think um, once the money began to slowly run out and all these companies started failing, it triggered um, essentially a panic. And so people started selling in mm. mass. So you think from 95 to 2000, the NASDAQ went from 1,000 to 5,000. That is a five-fold um, increase wow. from, yeah, in five years. That That's insane. That is – anybody should have taken a look at that and said, hey, this is – This might way be a bubble. Too, this, is, this might be a bubble. <laughs> you know, this is too quick. And nobody was doing the due diligence on these companies to ask, okay, how are they actually making money? That's a very simple question to ask. And I think that's Warren Buffett has a lot of talks on that of where he invests his money. He wants to be, and people call him kind of this boring investor, but he's very smart because he, he wants to understand how a company can make money. And a lot of people had no idea how these companies were generating revenue. They just knew that they were putting money into this hot new stock. They didn't want to get left out. They have this great website, this great idea, but it never generated revenue. It was never profitable. And it triggered a collapse in 2000. And um, that it, so the market went from one, the, the NASDAQ, I should say, went from 1,000 to 5,000. And then it went back down to like 1,000. So all of those gains just evaporated. And, and not every company was immune to this. So even like Cisco, Oracle, these tech giants who are still giants today, um, they lost like 80% of what they gained uh, during that uh, dot-com bubble. Um, and then there's a company called Amazon, which managed to survive the dot-com bubble. And typically, once those companies um, survived, they were able to um, come together and formulate a better business plan. But the NASDAQ didn't reach those levels again until like 2015 or 16. So it was a huge bubble that burst. Wow. But a lot of it goes down to the, the fundamentals. How does this company make money? Yeah. Don't get bought in on uh, a scheme, a get-rich-quick scheme through the market. Yeah, a big specu speculative bubble. Exactly. Oh, we're you not know, actually it, profitable, but we will be. We Yeah, we will be. We have this great idea. It looks cool. And then they run out of money. And it's interesting to look back at the Great Depression. In the 20s, people were buying, you know, there's this, okay, there's oil. I got to go buy this land because there's going to be oil there. I know it. And they were doing it on margin. So there's this, it's, it's interesting. It's another speculative bubble. It just happened again. Only instead of in oil and land, it happened uh, in IT and in, in the, the digital space. So thank you, Colin, for for that on the dot com stuff. It's it's interesting about the dot com bubble and in, in in bust in the late nineties because that was that was bad, but that was pretty limited to a single sector, right? Like we hadn't mm -hmm. we hadn't seen a you know market wide economic wide uh you know, downturn really since like the Carter, you know, the 79, 80, 81, like beginning of the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. um, things were bad. So just kind of continuing this theme, the nineties were more or less an era of good feelings to a certain extent. And there was this dot com bubble <clears throat> that was bad. There was a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs, but the entire economy didn't plunge. So, we don't we don't really see that kind of thing again until the Great Recession, right? And we, you know, the Great Recession started in like two thousand seven. Really, two thousand eight is when things got bad, but it wasn't as bad as the Great Depression. And oh, by the way, for our listeners here, the the terms depression and recession are s more or less subjective. <laughs> They're. Uh, <clears throat> They uh, like there's no objective metric like Adam Smith did not write in The Wealth of Nations like here's the definition of a depression and here's the definition of a recession. Like that's just kind of how it is. <laughs> um, anyway, so we get the Great Depression. We get the Great Recession. The Great Recession was started in one sector, but it really impacted every like everyone. Like I think we all kind of know it generally was in the housing market, but – like it impacted a lot of other sectors and a lot of other people besides the housing market. So Colin, can you tell us a little bit more about 
the Great Recession uh, and how how that was different than you know things before and how it impacted us today. Yeah, so the Great Recession had a lot of it affected. It had political ramifications, economic. I mean, geopolitical even. And speaking specifically to the economy, I'm going to back up just a little bit. So, like you said, the '90s were the steady, you know, post '87 stock market crash. The '90s, the feel good '90s. It was very steady. And in the late '90s to early 2000s, you had a lot of influx of foreign cash and investment from Asia and the Middle East, um, which Banks, when they have money, they don't just like to sit on it. They want to loan that money out and get that money out so that they can make money and fuel growth. That's like a tenet of capitalism. Capital fuels growth. And so in order for a bank to make money, they don't just want to sit on it. They want to make more money. So that found that money found its way into the mortgage industry. And then in 1999, there was the Glass-Steagall Act that was actually repealed. And so if you remember, the Glass-Steagall Act had a lot to do with financial regulation. And so when that was repealed, um, this is where you start to get the too big to fail uh, type of org- of banks because um, now mergers just started happening. These small um, financial institutions, small local banks just started getting bought up by these larger corporations and it created these massive financial entities that were quote unquote too big to fail. And a lot of that started in 99. So late nineties, you have this influx of foreign cash reserves, and then you also have the Glass-Steagall Act being repealed. And so then, um, you know, with even with 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq happening, even with all that going on, there was still an American dream that existed here stateside. And that was to own a home and owning a home was actually traditionally fairly difficult. If you look back into the 70s and 80s, in order to have a home, you had to have a um, proof of proof of income and verified. You had to put typically 20% down and you were going to pay about a, up as high as 15% of interest. So it was actually very difficult. So, you know, one of the criticisms we have now of, of previous generations is, oh, it was so easy to buy a home or you could have bought a home on a a factory worker's wage or something like that. But in reality, the barrier to entry was very high. So starting in the 2000s, that barrier started to get a lot lower with the idea that everyone should be able to own a home, which is a great idea, but in practice, it becomes very risky. And so a lot of those entry barriers that were set up before the 20% down, the verified income, you know, that was all to de-risk the mortgage industry. When a bank or a loaning industry and a lender evaluates you've ever bought a home, they're supposed to do their due diligence because once they have that loan, they are then going to um, basically package up that loan into a mortgage-backed security. And that eventually, and I'll get to it in a second, but it will find its way um, as an investment for potentially a pension fund. So if it is a risky mortgage, they are not just going to lose money, but other people can lose money as well. So they want to de-risk that mortgage-backed security and that mortgage they give to you. That's why um, you hear a common criticism, oh, well, my rent would be more than my mortgage. Yes, but as a renter, you do not carry the same uh, responsibilities that a um, someone who has a mortgage does. So that is what's happening. So right now, and it once we start having this lower barrier to entry, all of a sudden the demand for houses skyrockets. And it's not like the supply suddenly, um, you know, we had this huge influx of people and like our population went up, mat, you know, in this massive amount. That's not it. It was that these lower um, barriers to entry were, or these barriers to entry were lowered. So now more people could buy homes. The supply went down, the demand went up and the housing prices skyrocketed from like 2000 to 2006, they skyrocketed. Um, And with those increased home uh, values, people were taking out what they call um, home equity loans. So you buy a house for $500,000. Suddenly that house is worth $700,000 because your neighbor just sold their home for $700,000. So the value of your home just went up. Well, a lot of people want to furnish these nice homes that they just bought. So they don't have the capital. They take out a home equity loan, which is basically a loan on the equity that you have in your home, which overnight, suddenly you have $200,000 worth of equity. Not good because um, you don't actually have that, um, nor do you have the means to pay that back if you suddenly lose that equity in your home. 
So people started taking out home equity loans on these and they had risky um, loans that were given out. So you've heard the term adjustable rate mortgages, um, subprime loans, all of these were being given out. And a subprime loan, if you hear the term subprime, you should run away because that just sounds toxic. Um, and yeah, it, it just sounds bad in the name subprime. Like, Hey, we're giving you this piece of crap. Like nobody would say like, Hey, this yeah. is a subprime piece of food. Like, do you want to eat it? This is <laughs> like, <laughs> here's a subpar taco. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, no, I don't want that. <clears throat> but they were giving them out because they were making money hand over fist. Initially, the banks and lenders were making money hand over fist initially. So let's so this is that's the scene of how people were getting money. So let's take a look at how the banks and lenders were making money off of this. So as they're loaning all of this money out in order to bypass these you know so these giving out these subprime loans, they're giving out um, adjustable rate mortgages. They have to sell that loan, that mortgage backed security. So a mortgage backed security is basically saying like hey, we have this this investment, this investment, and is backed by the mortgage. And the term, you know, you hear the term, everybody pays their mortgage, so it's considered very safe. That's why a bank can come and foreclose on your home if you fail to pay your mortgage. It's backed by that home. Well, so nobody would buy from an investment bank or a lender a mortgage-backed security with a subprime loan or with no income verification or. Um, an adjustable rate mortgage, they would just stay away from it. So what they would do then is turn those into collateralized debt obligations. A collateralized debt obligation without getting way down into the weeds is basically this investment, this fund that pools all of these mortgage-backed securities together. So you would, you're like a AAA rated um, with something that is like just not is subprime. You know, you go down A, double A, A triple B and you go all the way down and then it gets to like subprime, pull them all together. And that is to quote, de-risk the collateralized debt obligation because now um, the likelihood of that whole CDO failing is a lot lower because it can, there's a certain threshold that they can reach of uh, mortgage defaults before that CDO fails. And so within a CDO, you have the, what they call tranches, which are basically um lines of um, where they would delineate who would get paid out first. So at the highest, you would have the safest one, the safest um, mortgage-backed securities, and they would pay out first. And then at the bottom, you'd have all, so you'd have all the, the trash, the trash down there at the bottom, but you'd have a really high payout because those insur- insurance, excuse me, interest rates were really high. Either way, a collateralized debt obligation, um, if you've ever watched the movie, um, The Big Short, uh, that is a great way to explain what a CDO is. <laughs> Basically taking in, it's not old fish, it's something new. That's exactly what a CDO is. You don't want to, you don't want these mortgage-backed securities sitting on your books. Put them all together. If they're bad, suddenly it's good. So those are being loaned out. And mind you, these are being sold eventually down to like pension funds and retirement funds, um, investment funds. So people's livelihood and pension was oftentimes re- basically reliant on people paying their mortgage. We'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> One of the things that I wanted to say here was you you did a good job tying in like, okay, one of the things about the housing industry that's different about the tech industry in like there's certain key sectors that have disproportionate impacts. We talked about the energy, uh, the energy sector having disproportionate impacts to uh, today, the thing about the mortgage industry is because those are that's the number one way that average people usually get a very large loan, right? Like small businesses and big businesses, right? They loan money from the bank too, but average average people don't usually take out significant uh, business loans. So if they take out a big loan, it's usually for a house, right? Well, when they can no longer pay their loans, so the banks are heavily uh, invested in people's homes. Well, when they can't pay, all of a sudden these banks collapse. Like that's one of the things. And when these banks collapse, then that starts affecting the businesses. So we get a similar situation that we had in the Great Depression, right? Where because the stock market crash and then the runs on the banks, these banks close. And I was... uh, 
I was just looking up in uh, in two thousand eight. 25 FDIC insured banks closed their doors. That was more than like the last de- prior decade combined. That was in 2008. 25 closed their doors. In 2009, 140 banks closed their doors. And in 2010, 157 banks closed their doors. And then for like the, re- the next few years, like almost 200 banks over the next few years close their doors. So like we basically get, uh, you know, just because these people's mortgages, um, they couldn't pay their mortgages and the banks. I remember talking to a buddy who he, he had several mortgages out. He was heavily leveraged and the banks, um, we're basically like, hey, bro, you got to pay right now. And he's like, I can't I can't pay all these right now. Hey, Jay, you brought up a good term. Before we get back to the Great Recession, what does leveraged mean for the average listener? So it just means that you're basically in debt up to your eyeballs. <laughs> 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 Which, to be, to be honest, to be leveraged is not necessarily a bad thing. So when you talk leverage, another way of quantifying how leveraged you in fact are is is your debt to equity ratio. So this is an accounting term, right? I think the average S&P 500 debt to equity ratio is somewhere around two two to one, right? So i.e., they have double the amount of debt, two to one, than they have equity. This is not a bad thing. This is because these S&P 500s make billions upon billions of dollars every single year. Their revenue, their revenue is ginormous. The American economy runs on debt. Absolutely. If you haven't realized that so far with our economy and our spending right now, the American economy runs on debt. And you can utilize debt in order to make more money, even as a retail investor or consumer. You can do it if you're smart. You have to be very careful, as we'll see. Yeah, it, it all depends on what your income is. And and to your point, for these subprime mortgages, what what we were finding out was these people couldn't actually afford these mortgages. Uh, to put it back in the business sense, sometimes and this this is super subjective and dependent upon what industry we're talking about, but there's there's successful businesses that have debt to equity ratios north up to like eight, nine, you know, once you start getting up in that territory, people start getting very concerned, but like having double the amount of debt to your equity, i.e. how much like assets you have on equity is how much assets you have on hand, more or less. Um, Like you can be, you could have eight times the amount of debt and you're still not bankrupt. You're still not necessarily like- You are able to make your payments. Insolvent. Right. You can still be solvent with that much debt. So, so Jay, I, I want to back up just a little bit because you brought up something about the, the due diligence piece of it and people not actually being able to pay that. Because not only were we lacking due diligence in people in, in investigating these mortgages prior to issuing them and lending them out, but there was a lack of due diligence amongst the CDOs in investment banking industry as a whole and the mortgage industry, I should say, as a whole. Okay, so we talked about people taking out loans that they and buying homes that they couldn't actually afford. Uh, the lending industry basically being unregulated and giving out subprime adjustable rate mortgages to people that didn't deserve it, and then selling that in a collateralized debt obligation to quote de-risk it. Now, the agency there are agencies that exist called rating agencies. So you've heard like Moody's companies like that. They exist to come in and provide a rating to these. And so like you hear like AAA rated, that's the highest possible rating. So Moody's job basically is to come in and do their due diligence on these and say like, hey, this is this mortgage back, you know, this collateralized debt obligation, this financial institution, we're going to give it a credit rating of AAA. Well, they were rating these AAA because these CDOs were basically de-risk. And if you 
look back on it, they were actually just giving it a AAA rating because they didn't want a financialist to lose financial interest institutions business because then they would just go to a different rating agency to say, hey, we want to give your rating. So whoever's going to give us the AAA rating is who we're going to go to. And however you have to look at the books and justify it on your side, that's fine. But if you want to get paid, you need to come and give us a AAA rating. And there was actually that kind of relationship. So that's the problem with paying a third party to come in and do um, – a credit about an evaluation of your business and due diligence, because if you're paying them, well, whose interest do they really have? They're going to have the interest of who's paying them. So they were, they were giving a, um, they were not doing their full due diligence. Then on top of that. So before a pension fund can have any kind of investment, it has to have a minimum threshold of security. So like they may not be able to buy like a single A rated bond or something like that. They would have their minimum is like a, a double A. So if Moody's came in and said, Hey, it's actually, you know, this is still really risky. It's still, it's a single A. Well, what if, what a company can do is go and say, okay, well, we're going to get an insurance policy on this bond and we're going to insure it through a company called AIG. AIG got into a lot of trouble during the recession and actually ducked a lot of it. Everybody vilifies the Lehman Brothers, but AIG actually had a lot to do with this. So we're looking at a mountain of risk in the mortgage industry, right? You know, not no due diligence from the rating agencies, no due diligence on the lenders, people taking out buying things that they shouldn't buy. Well, and then the insurance company comes in and says, "Hey, you know what?" By our financial models, which are totally not wrong, uh, we're going to offer a credit default swap, basically an insurance policy on these bonds and say, well, hey, you know, in the unlikely event that somebody defaults on it, we'll pay it out to make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's, everything's okay. So nobody, they don't lose their money. We're an insurance agency. Well, um, that's great because then you know a single a, a single a bond can go to a double a bond or a double a to a triple a and suddenly that pension you know that pension fund or whatever they can invest in it they can buy well the problem with being an insurance company is you actually have to have the capital and funds on hand in order to pay out in the event of a crisis well aig had about enough money and capital to pay out uh like a small percentage because they got greedy. They were getting it. They were charging a premium for the credit default swap, and there they were making money hand over fist. And they kept issuing out these credit default swaps, believing that there's no way that the mortgage industry to, could fail, and that they could continue to issue out these insurance policies and basically take free money because there's no way that five to ten percent of people would begin defaulting on their mortgages which is was kind of the threshold that was required in order to start um, triggering this this cascading collapse effect well it did happen and AIG everybody started going to AIG and saying well hey where's our insurance where's our money here's this here's the credit default swap where's our money AIG was like well we don't have it and that's where another term you hear the too big to fail because then the Federal Reserve had to step in and bail them out because they started taking a look at um, who AIG owned money to, owed money to, and if they didn't pay, if they didn't uh, bail out AIG, well, then you'd have this tri this I don't know, trickle down, but this cascading effect where all these other financial institutions would begin failing because they were so intertwined with this mortgage backed security industry that um, with AIG failing. All of these other banks would worldwide would begin failing, and so you'd have the, they believed that the Great Recession would get way worse. So they bought ended up buying I think um, it's like 180 billion dollars worth of these. You know they they bought 180 billion dollars worth of uh, AIG, and they actually replaced the board. They there was a big controversy because they paid a bunch of executives um, like millions of dollars, but. In reality, those executives were paid basically to come back and unscrew up what they screwed up and fix the books because they had done such a bad job, um, quite literally, well, well un intentionally um, making it an obscure process. And so they had to come in, unwind all that, and they got paid handsomely for it. But, um, you know, if you look at the Great, the great Recession, the canary in the coal mine moment probably would have been the new century financial going bankrupt. So they were the largest subprime mortgage lender. And then, uh, April of 2007, they went bankrupt and that should have been like the wake up call. Like, Oh man, this is bad. Like the subprime lender, the largest one just went bankrupt. 
Um, but it didn't. And it was, and in spring of 2008, so March, uh, Bear Stearns famously went uh, bankrupt. And it was like the day before they were out talking about how strong Bear Stearns was. I'm pretty sure, of course, um, you know, inverse Kramer would, you know, if you've watch uh yeah some Seinfeld Anything, no 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 I was gonna say Kramer on uh Jim Kramer on CNN if you basically oh, oh, you listen to yeah. anything you know, oh, Kramer, super, yeah oh yeah yeah no. yeah do it the opposite of what he says right <laughs> yeah um anyway but they they failed in 2008 and then finally uh the Lehman Brothers um uh, in September of 2008 went bankrupt they ended up owing with Another issue with these credit default swaps is they weren't regulated again. Uh, so with CDOs, they were on your books and it's not like you could sell them just overnight. It's like, hey, we got to get it off our books. We got to sell it. You had to find other buyers that were financial institutions. So if they went they went south and all, this, all of a sudden these mortgages were worthless, um, you were left holding it and it was now worthless. And the Lehman Brothers, I think, owed like $400 billion dollars. Um, and they just couldn't pay. And, and so in September, they went bankrupt. And then for the next month, the Dow Jones lost like 3,600 points, uh, which at the time was massive. Um, and that triggered the, the Great Recession, which lasted for about another two years. Like you just mentioned earlier, these all these banks and financial institutions started to go bankrupt. They, could, um, they couldn't cover their debts. Uh, they started going bankrupt. Unemployment reached um, somewhere around 10% average uh, for most Americans in 2009. Um, and I, I want to say, looking at this, there was over the next 18 months uh, about 17.9 or $19.2 trillion worth of wealth erased worldwide and $7.4 trillion of wealth just in the stock market alone was lost. Um, and we really didn't um, regain full employment, I think, until 2015. So, um, and, and, you know, for most millennials out there, you, this is kind of uh, like a very, this is sort of when you're coming of age and getting jobs and the job market was very difficult. If you look back and remember, it was very difficult to get a job coming out of college or making a transition in your career if you lost a job. Um, it really set a lot of people back um, several years uh, in professional development, and it it it's still having long lasting effects to today. One thing uh, that's interesting when you were talking about one of the key indicators that people uh, caught on to was that the largest lender of subprime loans went bankrupt, and it was April in two thousand seven. One thing that made me think about uh, is so China, China's largest property development company, Evergrande. Oh my gosh. I'm glad. This is a great transition, Jay. This is, this is a great today to today. Oh. Right. So they they have not gone bankrupt. However, uh, in December of last year, so less than a year ago, the S&P, which is another one of these rating companies, you know, we mentioned Moody's, S&P is another uh, credit rating company. In December of 21, S&P declared Evergrande to be in default because it's, it, failed to pay back uh one of its bonds so the so in response they're basically selling off various assets because these assets are not making them money um so they're trying they've not yet gone bankrupt but what we're but what's going on right now is the largest property development company i'm doing air quotes here <laughs> property <laughs> development company um is is looking at um, bankruptcy. It's not a guarantee that it'll happen, but this would be huge because in one of the same ways that our economy kind of ran into some difficulties, the very similar things are happening in, in China right now. Right. Jay, that's a really good point. So what if we're going to tie the Great Recession to what's going on today and some of these, you know, the canary in the coal mine moment, I think Evergrande is a really, that's a really good indicator. That's a great canary because much like AIG and some of these other banks were, quote, too big to fail because of this interwoven um, system that we had. So if one failed, it created a cascading effect where all these others would fail. Well, Evergrande, uh, or excuse me, BlackRock lost about $250 million uh almost immediately from Evergrande because um, they're, they have a heavy exposure to the Chinese real estate market. And the housing market in the Great Recession 
had worldwide effects, but it was triggered by the housing market in the U.S. Me personally, being the novice historian and, and economist, I tend to look at the Chinese real estate market and understand that there's a bubble. And something like Evergrande being in default is a very good indicator of that. If you look around, just just eyeballing it, you know, there's a great scene in again. I go back to uh, the Big Short, but we're like Steve Carell and his team are like down in Florida, and they're driving around and they're just kind of interviewing people and looking at the process to buy a home and just driving around at all the for sale signs. And they understand that like, this is really happening. If you go to China and you look at the real estate industry, there are entire cities built that are empty because they were built on this propped up investment from that was backed by the Chinese government, of course. And it's basically in reality, it's worthless because nobody's buying it. Nobody's living there. There's some cities that have less than 10% occupancy uh, because um, it was all built on a bubble. And if you looked right now in current events, um, the Chinese are not reporting a lot of key GDP numbers and they are intentionally doing that. I think because they are so bad that they could trigger, um, panic amongst its inv- its foreign investors, i.e. American financial institutions who will look at this and say, holy cow, we've got to get out immediately. And they will start pulling all of their funding um, before they lose all of it. So, um, And that could trigger, you know, like I said, uh, a, a recession worldwide. Right. Well, the good news here, for uh, specifically for Evergrande, is that the Chinese must be Keynesian economists. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Yeah, because the government, the Chinese government is intervening pretty, pretty significantly. Yeah, they're lining and, up tanks outside of banks to keep people from going on a run on their own money. Yeah, they, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. They, uh, Hong Kong, so in 2016, apparently an American, uh, short seller had basically published a report saying like Evergreen's financials suck. <laughs> And uh, he literally was suspended for five years uh, and was given a trading ban. And they basically said, like, hey, we need to relook at freedom of speech in Hong Kong's financial markets. <laughs> because if if any sort of scrutiny or due diligence would prove mm-hmm. that this is all a dog and pony show, this is not real. This is not there. The fundamentals are not there. And I, that's right. Shoot. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a millionaire investor or anything like that, but you can you can take a call it the sniff test. You know, the canary in the coal mine, the sniff test. You can take a look at it and say, hey, you know what? There's no way that they could sustain this level of growth naturally, um, yeah. and it not be a bubble. There's just no possible way. Yeah, and they're they're Keynesian. That's a great joke, but that's the only reason that a lot of their I think Evergrande is one of them. But I think that's why their economy has not. Uh, fully collapsed if you will you know they're they're basically propping it up for right now yeah and we've we've kind of known that the chinese do some super sketchy stuff with their books um you know and their and their currency uh along the way but so jay you know bring it, tying it back to the american economy in in the post and i just want to hit on this um to kind of summarize the series and in, in this episode, but politically speaking, after the the, the Great Recession, there was two. Uh, you know, there's the TARP Act and there's the ARRA, um, and those were you know the TARP Act was basically the bailout. So that was the government coming in and spending seven hundred billion dollars to bail the banks out. That created a massive political backlash on the right and left. So a lot of um, you know, on the right, it was the Tea Party who had its roots in the um, the CSE. So, it was, um, consumers for sound economic policy had ties to the the Koch brothers. But the Tea Party was basically like the government is too big. We don't like this. We want a more laissez faire government, and we want to. You know, here's the government's delineated responsibilities we do not we are pissed that they bailed the banks out they overstepped their their authority and we're upset about it on the left you had the occupy wall street and if you remember it it was where um you know, they had a bunch of i don't know homeless people <laughs> you had a bunch of protesters <laughs> who showed up and they occupied wall street for like two or three months and 
it kind of fizzled out as a movement, but I think it was, it was very interesting to see like they were up, the left was just as mad and they kind of had a different sort of solution. They wanted the people to be bailed out by the government. And I think it's interesting as we look back in this whole series that in, um, you know, most on the socialist side of the America of America, they wanted a kind of a minimum standard of living, a minimum quality of life provided to them by the government. And it goes back all the way to one of the first episodes where we talked about, um, you know, like the social contract in Rousseau and, hey, you know what, we're going to give up some of our individual freedoms for the greater good and the good of the collective. And, you know, it is the government's responsibility. And that really evolved, you know, it, that did that did not exist during the mercantile system um, prior to the Civil War. And it really didn't start taking shape um, up until the Gilded Age. But they believed through you know, and there's some validity to what they were asking for a minimum wage, uh, no child labor, please, uh, you know, child labor laws, you know, uh, we want some unions that have a say for workers rights, but they, you know, ultimately at the end of the day now and occupy wall street kind of, and the, the left mo- the socialist movement. Now it's really, the government needs to provide this. These are the things that we want from the government to provide to us. Whereas on the right with the tea party and they kind of embodied it, it was much more of a, Hey, we want to do this on our own. We, you know, we do not want the government to step in. Our rights are not derived from the government. The government exists simply to protect the rights that we have, um, from that are bestowed to us from a higher power. We want to continue to proceed down this way. And so you've had this real factionalization. I think it's only gotten a lot worse since, you know, really the the Great Recession is where you could say it started. But I think that's where we're seeing now. And now the country's kind of moving further and further in those two, um, you know, economically speaking, I'll keep it like that, uh, where people want on one side, a minimum standard of living provided by the government. The other ones want absolutely no government intervention in their uh, ability to go forth and create wealth for themselves break yeah. break sorry break break no, go ahead no that's a that's a really good way of putting it um because a lot of a lot of debates between socialism and capital capitalism these days um they don't like they have these like ethical connotations to it and 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 that's good and fine but you know, just to give a, another shout out to Thomas Sowell here, love Thomas Sowell on this podcast. He has a really good book called A Conflict of Visions. And what the ethical uh, debates kind of miss out on is what vision for the world that each one um, uh, uh, gives. To put it to put it in like theological terms here. <laughs> It's like what is what is capitalism's and in, in, in socialism's eschatology, right? Like, what is their view of the end of the world? Like, what is their view of the future of the world? Like, what does things look like? What is the end that we are all progressing towards? And I think socialism, to be as fair as I can possibly be, again, I'm not a socialist, so. You know, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but to be as fair as I possibly can be, socialism is trying to formalize a system where the the people who don't want to work are enabled to not work. <laughs> Whereas capitalism says if you don't work, you don't eat. And you and and that's where you kind of get this like you get what you deserve in capitalism versus socialism says, no, I'm going to require you, a producer, to give me, the consumer, what I want, regardless if I produce anything. So, I, and this is why kind of going back to our conversation about why socialism struggles is it has – its eschatology sounds good at face value. Like its, it's in view is – Oh man, like wouldn't it be a great world to live in if there was no homelessness, if there was no poverty, if there was no hunger, right? Uh if everybody took care of everybody and the and the wealthy just kind of, you know, helped everybody else out. Like that sounds good at face value. But what it misses is a very important component of 
of human nature and natural law to tie it back to our uh, our American political origins podcast. And that is people don't want to be required to give things to other people because it's no longer charity at that point. It's just stealing. <laughs> Socialism it is trying to remake human nature or as capitalism basically tries to um... – I don't want to say exploit it for the, but no. yeah. accept it for what accept it is. Accept it, yeah, exactly. Accept it for what it is. I was going to say exploit, you know, exploit the working class, but <laughs> no. It, <laughs> it, Are it, you it a accept- communist? <laughs> <laughs> it maximizes yeah. human nature. It is what it is, and it utilizes human nature to create the best ends. That's probably the best way to think of capitalism, and it's you not know, always. I- it's sorry. Go ahead. I don't know. I don't think it maximizes human nature because the problems with capitalism, as we've talked, I mean, just like all these speculation things, like I'm going to be irresponsible with my money. I'm going to, I'm going to try this get rich quick scheme uh, and it doesn't work out. uh, Mm. This is my, this is my main disagreement with the greed is good argument that some I think ignorant capitalists uh, talk Gordon about <laughs> right the Gordon geckos of the world <laughs> because capitalism does not thrive well on greed uh, as a, the whole reason why we have boom and bust cycles is because greed is a bad thing and it and it causes busts <laughs> right so what capitalism thrives on is a more accurate understanding of how the world actually work works but yet it still has its faults and that faults is primarily rooted in human nature itself. Like human beings Mm. are fallible Mm. and the economic systems that we create are fallible. Whereas socialism assumes all human beings are good, which I personally disagree with. Um, By nature, we are not just awesome people. And for those listening, I'll, I'll finish my tangent with this on the, whether or not all human beings are good, do we have to teach children to be good or bad? Which one are they naturally inclined to? Anyone with kids knows the blatantly obvious answer to this question. We have to teach our children how to be good because they are naturally not good. That's just in our nature. So capitalism it's it's not it takes advantage of our better angels it mm. rather just ex- it simply accepts that we are naturally not good people and it is the most the most accurate economic system to those to those natures however if people were in fact good capitalism would actually function even better than it functions right now <laughs> there would be no bus cycles correct that's why i am in favor you know the I've been critical of libertarians before, but politically speaking, they – if men were angels, there would be no no need for government. Well, the same thing goes for capitalism. There needs to be some kind – you're right. There needs to be some sort of limit limitation offered by something outside of just uh, a corporation uh, you know, limiting itself within the own ca- their own capitalist society. So, so I think well, – I'll, yeah, I'll, go ahead. I'll do you one better here. Do it. I'm sorry. I interrupted. Keep going. No, 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 no. I want to, I, you, go ahead. I want to hear. So it's like, instead of limitations, we should consider competition, which is, you know, if you ask any good Chicago School of Economics uh, person, mm-hmm. the competition mechanism is the restraining and promoting effect for economic activity because – Instead of imposing this third party entity, i.e. the government, in limiting certain things, Mm. rather the free market itself through competition, limits is not the right word, but it generates the same effect, right? It it prevents monopolies. Right. Uh, And I, I agree, you know, if you read Milton Freeman, just specifically on the note of monopolies, he has very compelling arguments that... Government intervention is actually what helps monopolies occur, not the other way around. A free mm. market doesn't help monopolies occur. Rather, it's the government creates rules that certain businesses use to exploit that allows them to become a monopoly. Anyway, so I, I try to bring this bring this home here in the sense that 
for capitalism, we need the competition mechanism. And and mm. we only need the government to interfere or inter- interfere in order to introduce more uh, competition. Yeah, I think Milton Friedman in his book, Capitalism and Freedom, had very specific small parts for the government to play. Um, like... <laughs> I think overseeing contracts or something like that, or enforcing contracts between institutions or something like that, but very small, but you're right. I think you may even use like the post office as an example. I mean, it's just a monopoly. If you didn't, I'm going to use it because that is for the longest time, the post office was the only means to deliver mail or packages and suddenly introduce FedEx and or FedEx and UPS. And suddenly the USPS has to get a lot better because no one wants to use it. Then introduced Amazon and now FedEx and UPS are like, oh, wow, we have to get even better. And you can order something on the internet that is across the country and get it the next day. You can, you can get something that's ordered locally and get it the same day. That is unthinkable uh, years ago. Um, and I would like to thank a little bit of a uh, little bit of competition for creating that because guess what you are not going to ship and a business is not going to ship use you as a um, as a means to ship goods to to their customers if you can't deliver better service at a good price right no that's accurate man this is this is a gr- this is a great way to close it um <laughs> Just in the yeah. interest of time, I, I wanted to say we, we started dipping it. So that those are our thoughts on on just this entire series as a whole of socialism and capitalism. We've covered a ton. We've the origins of the American economy, some of our political thought when it comes to socialism and capitalism and working in in the United States. We've left it off and we left it off with where we're at. You know, you can take a look around and see a, a growing divide. Um Left it off of where we're at. That's a great way to say it. <laughs> That's we did That's, indeed leave off where we are at. <laughs> That's a great way to say like we're right here. We're, we're we, we are, are who we where thought they we are. At. <laughs> they were who we thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new catchphrase for the for the podcast. We yeah. left off where we're at. <laughs> where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh my That's gosh. Good. Anyway. One of the last things we touched on in this episode, though, was Evergrande and the Chinese government and the Chinese economy, which I think is a great segue into the next series that we're going to be talking mm. about. And we're going to be talking about mm. the history of Chinese and American relations. So right now, if you haven't paid attention, uh, under the Trump administration, it was always funny listening to hear him say China. But um, China. <laughs> China. China. <laughs> China. Um, that I cannot ex- do it. I don't have a I, New Yorker accent. I'm, yeah. I'm going to get a sound clip and just play it every time it comes up. But <laughs> anyway, we're going to be talking. A, they've been in the forefront of the news. If you buy any good, it comes from China. More than likely, it comes from China. Our economies are absolutely intertwined to the point that if one fails, the other probably will too. There's some fascinating history about where we got to today and how we got there. And that's what Jay and I are going to cover next on our next mini series. So please come in and listen for our, uh, our next series on the Chinese American relations. Yeah. Thanks, Colin, for wrapping this up. Super pumped to talk about uh, American Chinese relations for our next series. Uh, I heard someone say the other day that. Um, the United States will be in competition with China for the next 100 years. And to me, that like really helped zoom out to, oh, wow, like we're not actually talking about current crises here. Like China is, is more or less out of its century of humiliation and they are here. Uh, Sounds like a marathon. Yeah. Well, hundred year marathon. Don't get me started on that book. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to talk about it. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. Uh, And I can tell you why I don't recommend you read that book. But anyway, we'll we'll save that conversation for for the future here. But hey, if you enjoyed this episode, uh, uh, we really appreciate you listening. Uh, We enjoy doing this podcast for you. (laughs) Uh, So thank you. Big thank you to all of our listeners out there. You guys are awesome. 
Uh, I'm super pleased with all of the non US listeners that we have about uh, 35% ish of our listeners are from outside the United States. And to me, it is mind blowing that there are people who are not Americans that actually give a crap about what we have to say. (laughs) This really wasn't we didn't intend this to be an American podcast, but it seems like the last like two series that we've done have just been all about. So we're going to try and branch out a little bit now. So sorry, international listeners will probably appreciate this. Yeah. Well, if you enjoy learning about America, here here you go. But uh, uh, you're also getting some Americans' perspective on global events. But on that note, we actually want to hear from y'all uh, and our American listeners as well. Uh, another shout out. Can I just give a shout out to all the listeners that we have in Chicago? <laughs> We have a ton of listeners from Illinois and Chicago. You guys are awesome. I don't know who you are <laughs> and why uh, Why Chicago all of a sudden just – maybe it's because I keep talking about the Chicago School of Economics and, uh, and what a fan I am. And they're just like, yes, our people. But anyway, thank you. Do, you. do you call people from Chicago Chicagoans? What do you call them? I don't know. <laughs> Feel free to feel free to respond to Jay's question. Yeah, tell me what do you guys call yourselves? Uh, anyway, thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, if you want to interact with us, we're on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. You just search for Loins of History, or you can click the link in the show notes. If you really like this podcast, uh, you can uh, support us as well through uh, Anchor, who hosts our webpage, or we have a Patreon page as well. And uh, but the number one way that you can help us out is by leaving a rating. The The ratings really help us uh, uh, get the word out. That actually helps promote where people find their podcasts on the podcast websites themselves. So rate us on Spotify, rate us on Apple, rate us on Podcast Attic, wherever you uh, listen to us. That would be greatly appreciated. And with that, I think that does us here for the Boys of History. And we're looking forward to seeing you next week. 